So welcome to Plodcast, the Plodcast, the one and only Plodcast, episode 92. Thanks for joining us. So I wanted to, today, uh, our my foray into discussion of current events is uh, something that at, at the time of recording this has just happened a day or so ago. Uh, one of the many contenders for the, the Democratic nomination for um, president, that, that particular clown car review, um, one of the contenders is um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg, something like that, Buttigieg, that's right. So uh, he is the mayor, and I... South Bend, maybe he's he's the mayor of an, uh, a city in uh, Indiana, and see he he hasn't registered enough in my consciousness for me to even know what city that is. But he's in he has been an Indiana uh, mayor, and of course the vice president of the United States, um, Mike Pence, was the governor of um, was the governor there, and so um, when and what ha- and uh, Mayor Pete. Uh, recently made headlines by, uh, in, oh, excuse me, uh, Mayor Pete is an open open and avowed homosexual. And so he is, uh, in some respects, more interesting than uh, the other um, folks. He's, he's white. He is, he looks like a clean-cut politician type from the Midwest. But uh, he does his homosexuality count, for example, in the identity politics sweepstakes that are going on with the um, the race for the Democratic nomination? Well, he recently made his homosexuality a thing, and um, and attacked Mike Pence over it. Now they were they had worked to get together in state politics um, uh, before this. But he goes out. He he uh, attacks the Mike Pence's of this world, and he says basically he said to Mike Pence, "Your quarrel is with my creator. Your quarrel is with my creator." Now there are a couple of things going on here. I I want to address uh, first what I think is. Um, um, a lack, shall we say, in Mike Pence's um, approach to this whole thing, because all the indications are that apart from Mike Pence refusing to applaud or endorse what I call same-sex mirage, uh, you know, so he, if you said to Mike Pence, what is your position on homosexuals marrying each other? He could say truthfully, I'm against it, and I've always been against it. So he doesn't applaud same-sex marriage, right? But when it comes to all kinds of other stuff, he is not, he doesn't have, um, you know, he, he is not uh, at war with the homosexual jihad that's going on. So Mike Pence is saying, no, I demure, I don't, I don't agree with that, and I applaud that. I'm glad that he doesn't agree with that. But he has been um, altogether gracious. He was gracious on an individual level to Buttigieg, and, and so Buttigieg turns around and attacks him for it. So one of the things that we, one of the lessons that, um, that we ought to, we need to take away from this, conservative Christians, uh, need to take away from this is that uh, us fighting the the sodomy agenda, us fighting this whole thing, whether it's trans, whether it's the tranny thing or the homosexual thing or the the homosexual marriage, us fighting it with all the weapons at our disposal are is not a for, is not any more offensive to the bad guys than a mild, soft-spoken demurring at the last line, the line of marriage. All right, so Mike Pence has conducted himself on, this, on, uh, on these matters as a true gentleman and not as uh, what I would call, I, would, I, would, I hope that I go down as identified as sort of a, a reformed saloon brawler. 
Uh, Mike Pence is not a saloon brawler. Um, he's been a real gentleman, but that has gotten him absolutely nothing. It gets him absolutely nowhere because the sexual revolutionaries are are not interested in anything shy of total and complete victory on these points. And that w- we ought to take a page out of their playbook. We ought to be content with nothing short of absolute and total victory either. And that mean, does, what does that mean? That means, um, well, that means same-sex mirage will one day be outlawed. It will no longer be a thing. It's not marriage. Transgender marriage is not marriage. And we're going to stop at some point in the future when we repent, after we repent, we will repent of having thought that it was marriage. We will repent of having thought that there was something to it. So that's one thing. Um, We should want to be righteous, not nice. Sometimes righteousness is nice. Sometimes righteousness is polite. Other times it isn't. Jesus wasn't being polite when he flipped over the money changers' tables. He was being righteous, but he wasn't being polite. So the first thing is uh, Christians need to develop a sense of when it, when uh, we need to pull out, uh, when, when we need to just say, sorry, not going to do it. Let me think about it. No. So that's one thing. The second thing is the with the substance of what um, Mayor Pete said when he said, your quarrel is with my creator. He was, he was appealing to natural law. He was saying that I was made this way. I was born this way. And so Mike uh, Pence, Mike Pence's of this world, you need to understand that your, um, what do you call it? Your quarrel, your beef is not with the um, homosexual activists. Your beef is with the God whom you claim to serve. Well, there's a couple problems with this. One, if if we're talking about what God tells us in his special revelation in the Bible, we have two things going on that we have to contend with. One is the doctrine of creation, and the other is the doctrine of the fall. We are not simply created beings. Mayor Buttigieg is not merely a creature. He is also a sinner. And because he is both a creature and a sinner, he can't point to one sexual aspect of his life and say to Mike Pence, your quarrel is with my creator. I mean, a pedophile couldn't say that. Can a pedophile stand up and say, I've wanted to have sex with children as long as I can remember, as long as I've had sexual desires, they've been oriented that way. Your quarrel is with my creator. No, we, we'd say the reason this is a mistake that this person is making is that he's appealing to the doctrine of God as creator, but ignoring the doctrine of God as lawgiver. God is not just the, our creator, but he's also the lawgiver, and he's the one who exiled our first parents from the Garden of Eden for their, for their rebellion against him. So when someone says, your quarrel is with my creator, they are assuming that they are unfallen and of course, they are the ones who are unfallen. If we if we go down the street and look at some of the other things that creatures do, we, uh, some very fallen things or demented things, we find out that we can't say of those who are interested in bestiality or those who are necrophiliacs or those who are pedophiles or pederasts. Uh, they, they, why can't they say, Mike Pence, your quarrel is with my creator? Well, they can't, the reason they can't say that, everybody knows that the doctrine of the fall still applies to them. Right? But this is incoherent. It's schizophrenic. The doctrine of the fall, if it's the doctrine of the fall at all, is a doctrine that applies to everyone. It applies to Mayor Pete. It applies to Mike Pence. It applies to me. It applies to you. All right, so I, um, we've come now to my book review section um, of the podcast, uh, podcast 92, um, and I've done a bad thing here. I've, I, I jotted down the title of the book that I wanted to review, and I neglected to um, 
write the name of the author down. And it's an odd name, and I it it's and it's a, and it has escaped me completely. Mea culpa. So the, this is bad. But if you Google if you Google this uh, this book, or if you type this into the search bar in Amazon, I'm sure that you'll the name will pop right up. I'm sure the book will come up. The book is How Football Explains America. How Football Explains America. And this is really a fascinating book, both on its discussion of uh, some of the uh, some of the ways that football developed over time. The, the game is uh, very different than it was in, than it was at the beginning of the 20th century, back in the day when there was no face no face masks and there were leather, leather helmets and and people died regularly. You know there was that kind of football, and now it's. Um, um, very, um, very slick, professionalized, grown-up sport, but the basics of the sport are there. And and this book uh, uh, draws a connection between how Americans think about the world and how a football game um, operates. So, uh, you, if you're looking down at the gridiron, you're looking down at the football field. That football field is, imagine it as a continent. That football field is a continent. And uh, the, the team, the, the offense, is basically engaged at, in an attempt at manifest destiny. The ball is a territorial marker. The ball is a territorial marker. So what you want to do is march down the field if the if the team to the right is the receiving team, they catch the football, and you're looking. You're there in the stands watching them march toward the left. They are conducting a football drive toward California. They are, they are trying to make it to the Pacific Ocean. This is a manifest destiny game. It's all about conquering the frontier. It's all all about making inroads into new territory, um, and it's. It, it really is like a um, like like a little war in, in microcosm. There's the offense, the, there's the defense. There are some other interesting um, things about uh, about this. So, for example, um, the author, forgotten his name, sorry, explains how where the the huddle came from. One wit uh, described a football game as committee meetings punctuated with violence. So. You have a committee meeting, and then um, you uh, go out and run the play, and then you come back and have another committee meeting. Well, um, this book goes into the development of the huddle, which really is an odd. Um, it's an odd sort of thing, you know. In a football game, there's a good bit of standing around. So you, uh, well, let me back up and compare it to baseball. In in baseball, you're watching, and something might happen at any time, right? But it also might be that someone fouls off, you know, hits a foul ball 17 times in a row. Uh, But something might happen at any time, which is why if you're on the field, it holds your attention because the the ball might be coming toward you at any time. Um, And you have to think if it comes here, I go to second. If it if it goes to third, I cover this base, you know, all of all of that. Um, In football, you have, you're guaranteed that something will happen uh, within a certain specified uh, time and the, because the clock's running down and something must happen within that time. And you have your huddle and then you get up to the line and you uh, run your play. Well, um, the, uh, the huddle developed. There was a, a, a school that was uh, competing uh, – uh, school that was fielding a football team, and it was a school of um, deaf students. And they de- they were the ones who developed the huddle initially so they could signal what the play was going to be without the other, without the other team catching on. Uh, so that's, that's where the huddle came from. And then, and this was self-consciously, this is, was self-consciously done by an evangelical coach. It was, this was not something that where the author is pointing to accidental um, uh, points of uh, um, overlap. But this was self-consciously done. The huddle is very much 
like a Wednesday night prayer meeting. What you do is you gather together with your teammates um, to compare notes, confess your sins. My bad, I dropped it, I or I wasn't where I ought to have been. You confess your sins. You ref, you um, receive absolution. You encourage one another. We can do better. You know, we can we can do it. Let's uh, do better next time. Let's uh, let's go for it. Yeah, pat each other on the back and then go on three. And then you head out and run the play. Then you come back and you encourage one another again. So um, th- there, I- there really is, a, I think, a deep psychological bond between a population, of, you know, a, a population of a country and the national sport. What's the, what's the, um, What's the national sport? Now, we've got um, the baseball is, is, I would say, the reigning uh, contender for being the national pastime. But football's big, too. And then in a weird sleeper sort of moment, the biggest, the single biggest sporting event in North America, as measured by tickets sold and number of people in the stadium, um, the, the sport that far and away blows all the other sports away is NASCAR. Um, so racing cars, that's bigger, that's bigger than the NFL. That's, that's bigger than ev- everything. And that's racing cars. Uh, my friend, Peter Hitchens, uh, would say that figures, you know, we, uh, Peter and I have, uh, had an interesting running back and for- forth. He, he, he does not understand the American love affair with cars and, uh, uh, and when you think about it, we uh, Americans really do have a thing with cars. Uh, we sing songs about our cars. Um, <laughs> tell her, tell her, daddy takes her T-bird away, or uh, Hot Rod Lincoln, or yeah, you know, just all of the. So we we sing songs about our cars. And the biggest national sport is to watch cars race. But if you're talking about people on the field, a regular sort of a traditional sport. Um, but basketball and baseball and football are all in there contending. Um, and you look at the rest of the world and the fact that th- the premier sport overwhelmingly outside of North America is, um, is soccer, uh, there is some sort of deep affinity between the, the mentality of the population and the kind of uh, play that is um, conducted on the field. So... This uh, this book, there's a lot of a lot of great tidbits about football, the history of football, the history of America. Um, I commend it to you. How football explains America. So we podcast ninety two. We come to um, our hamartiology section. The word antilogia, anti anti. Legia refers to contradiction and strife. During his earthly life, the Lord Jesus had to deal with the contradiction, there's, our, there's the word, onto Legia, the contradiction of center, sinners, Hebrews 12, 3. And when men fall into quarreling and strife, an oath can put an end to it, Hebrews 6, 16. So, when there is some sort of quarrel or battle or verbal battle going on, they've fallen into quarreling and strife, ontologia. Uh, an oath can put an end to it. Most of the time, this word is found in Hebrews, with just one exception in Jude. A certain kind of man destroys himself by his gainsaying, just as Korah did. That's in verse 11 of the book of Jude. Um, Antilogio, you know, the, the word logeo, it means, is the verb for speaking, and logos is the word for world, and um, uh, anti, antilogia is the contrary word. And so the gainsayer is the kind of person, if, if you say it's, <laughs> you know, it's raining outside, he, without even looking, without even checking, the gainsayer says, no, it's not, not, not raining at all. He wants to contradict he, his natural impulse is to contradict, particularly um, so, some people just want to contradict whatever it was you said. But the the true gainsayer, the true contradictor, is the one who wants to um, 
uh, contradict particularly the truth. The truth is what he's actually interested in overthrowing. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.